Welcome to this first Suffolk Villages Festival video. Like all other music organisations, SVF has been in suspended animation since the middle of March. We've had to postpone for a year the concert we planned for the end of May, a rare performance of Handel's Theodora, as well as our unique musical tea party in June. That was to feature two of our regular soloists, the bass Stuart O'Hara and the violinist Asuka Sumi. Asuka kindly recorded a taster for that event, which we're hoping to put on next June. The piece is Heinrich Bieber's unaccompanied violin Pasigalia, which we've already put on our YouTube channel. Do listen to it if you haven't already done so. It's a superb performance of a wonderful piece. We were also sad to have to take the decision in the middle of the lockdown to cancel the 2020 festival, or at least postpone it to August 2021. It's the first time we've had to cancel a festival concert since we started in 1988. We would have begun yesterday with a complete concert performance of Monteverdi's opera L'Orfeo, the grand finale of our six-year Monteverdi project. With about 25 singers and 21 instrumentalists, including seven wind players, that's clearly not possible at the moment. This evening, we would have had a spectacular Bach concert featuring Brandenburg Concerto No. 4, the orchestral suite number three, and the two rarely performed concertos for three harpsichords and strings. It's not often three harpsichords are assembled on the same platform, so Stephen Devine took the opportunity to make a spectacular arrangement for three harpsichords of Bach's famous organ to Carter and Fugue in D minor. We look forward to hearing the world premiere of that next year. On the Sunday, tomorrow, we planned a celebrity recital from the mezzo-soprano Helen Charleston and her father Terence. I'm very pleased that Helen has provided as a substitute three items from a concert they recorded last year. We'll begin this video with that. She introduces them, two songs by Purcell and a spectacular aria by Handel, so I'll hand over to her in a moment. But before I do, I'd just like to thank everyone who's supported our Musicians Fund. It's enabled us to pay our professional performers cancellation fees for the postponed concert without digging further into our reserves. So sit back and enjoy Helen and Terence Charleston in Purcell and Handel, a delightful taster for their recital next year. I always enjoy coming to the Suffolk Villages Festival, so I was really sorry that both the May and the August weekends this year have fallen foul to coronavirus. But thanks so much to Peter and Louise for inviting me to be part of this online concert in lieu of the recital that I would have been giving this weekend with Terence Charleston. It's given me a nice opportunity to go back through some footage that I have of concerts that I've done over the last few years. And I've chosen to share with you three pieces from a concert that Terence and I gave last summer uh, in Hertfordshire. And it's a very similar programme, actually, that we were going to present this weekend. The three pieces I've chosen are two songs by Purcell, If Music Be the Food of Love and O oh Solitude, as well as an exciting, a fiery Handelian aria. Uh, this is Dover Justitia Amor, Polonesso's aria from Ariadante. Polonesso is the ultimate baddie, really. He has spent a lot of the opera lying to everyone, telling tales, getting people in lots of trouble. Um, and here you see that need for victory. He talks about uh, duty, justice, love, all of those things, but really what they, what they create in his breast that he really, really wants is victory. He wants to be the ultimate winner.
After that, we suddenly need a change of mood and pace. Mark Cordell has been part of the festival from the beginning. He played in the very first concert, and despite a busy professional career, now interrupted like everyone else, he returns most years to play the bass violin, the ancestor of the modern cello, with our resident early string group, the John Jenkins Consort. He also gives us frequent solo recitals on the bass viol or viola de gamba. We're extremely fortunate that he's partly local. He lives some of the time in Colchester, his other homes in Poland. Over the last few years, Mark's been working on J.S. Bach's gamba music, in particular, experimenting with chamber pieces that have come down to us as flute music, but which work well on the gamba. There's a good precedent for this. J.S. Bach's first sonata for gamba and harpsichord was arranged by the composer from a trio for two flutes and continuo. The work he's recorded specially for us is the rarely performed partita for solo flute. It's come down to us in A minor, but Mark has found that he works very well on the gamba, a tone lower in G minor. That might well have been its original key. This afternoon, we're showing his recording of two of the movements, an expressive saraband and a lively bourrée anglaise. I'm not sure what's English about this bourrée, except that Bach was influenced by some harpsichord suites by the French composer Charles Dupas, who settled in London around 1700. Anyway, we're going to put the whole suite on our YouTube channel after this broadcast. Mark recorded it at home in Colchester. You'll see he's sitting in front of a family heirloom, a fine 18th century English chamber organ.
Mark Cordell playing two movements from J.S. Bach's Partita for solo flute, arranged by him for viola da gamba. We're extremely grateful to him for recording it specially for us. Do watch it complete on our YouTube channel. We're going to end this Suffolk Vintages Festival broadcast with a mini recital by Stephen Devine, who's also been involved in the festival for a long time. He's given us many solo and chamber recitals, and each year he works with the orchestra on a larger scale project. We're extremely fortunate that he finds time in his busy international career to come down to Suffolk. Before I hand over to him, I want to say a little more about our future plans and to outline the background of the music he's going to play today. I've already mentioned three of the festival concerts postponed to next year. On the Monday of the festival, we would planned two events. In the morning, the renowned medieval group Joglaressa were going to explore popular music of the time, and in particular medieval dance music. You can get an idea of what they planned from the title Boogie Nights, that's Nights with a K. We're hoping to reschedule this fun programme, suitable as they say for children of all ages, as our spring concert next year. Our final festival concert will have to be postponed by a complete year. It was to have been an exploration of French Baroque dance and music given by Ricardo Barros, his dancing partner Kath Walker and Essex Baroque Orchestra, directed by myself. This will be worth waiting for. Ricardo made a great impression when he took part in the 2017 festival, and we've planned a delightful programme featuring original choreographies for music by Lully and other French Baroque composers, ending with extracts from Handel's Terpsichore, which we did complete with Ricardo in 2017. This extraordinary combination of French court dance and Italian opera was written for a famous French ballerina who was in London in 1734. More immediately, we're beginning to explore ways of resuming live concerts, or at least concerts with a live component. At the moment, we think that concerts with a choir and orchestra would be impossible for the foreseeable future, but we are planning a purely instrumental concert to be given by the John Jenkins Concert on a Sunday afternoon in November in St Peter's, Sudbury. This will be socially distanced, both for performers and audience, will be about an hour long, and will include such precautions as, I'm afraid, no interval or interval drinks with free sanitised programmes placed in advance on the seats. The programme will cover the great period of English chamber music from Orlando Gibbons to Henry Purcell. This concert will be offered free as a thank you to our supporters who have helped us so much in this difficult year, though tickets will also be available to the general public. As a bonus for those unable to come or nervous about doing so, we are planning to put an edited version of the concert on our YouTube channel with donations invited. We'll give you more details when things become clearer. That also applies to our Christmas concert, planned for Sunday 13th of December in Dedham Parish Church. It was to feature the medieval group Mediva, with our resident choir Sarmody and our SVF Children's Choir, 
Again, the combination of loud wind instruments and choirs makes it unlikely we can put it on this year, so we're planning to postpone it to Christmas 2021. But please keep the date in your diaries because we're planning an exciting alternative. Same place, same time. More details soon. Anyway, back to the matter in hand. Stephen Devine's MIDI recital. He recorded it specially for us at home in Kent a few weeks ago, using his splendid large two-manual harpsichord by Colin Booth. It was copied from one made in Hamburg in 1710 by J.C. Fleischer, the sort of instrument that young Bach would have known and revelled in. Stephen's going to introduce each piece himself, so all I need to do is to outline a little historical context. When Bach was growing up, he was heir to a tradition that went back several generations. It said that as a boy, he practised in secret by moonlight from a book of keyboard pieces by earlier members of his family, as well as family friends such as Georg Böhm, organist at Lüneburg in northern Germany, and Johann Parkerbell. Parkerbell, organist of Nuremberg in southern Germany, was closely involved with the Bach family. In addition, a formative influence was the great organist and composer Diederik Buxtehude, organist of Lübeck on the Baltic. Bach made a pilgrimage to visit him in 1705, and it said he would have been in line to succeed him had he been prepared to marry his daughter. I'm not sure what was wrong with Fraulein Buxtehude, but it's also said that Handel turned down the same opportunity. Be that as it may, Stephen's going to start with an extraordinary and mysterious piece that was attributed at the time to various people, the Italian composer Michelangelo Rossi, Henry Purcell and J.S. Bach himself. They're all impossible for one reason or another. Various other candidates have been proposed, but it's recently been suggested that it's actually by Buxtehude. Anyway, I don't want to go on and on. Before I hand over to Stephen, one last thought. Music like this was written to work equally well on a church organ or a large harpsichord. The idiom is essentially the same for both, with organists adding pedal parts where necessary. So the last piece in Stephen's programme, Bach's great youthful toccata in D major, might have been originally written for organ, but it's thought of as one of his harpsichord works. It works brilliantly on both instruments.
Hello and welcome to this recital of German harpsichord music. I'm delighted to be able to present this for you, um, although of course very sad that I can't perform it for you live and in person. However, it does mean that here in Kent you get to see my lovely German harpsichord. It's a copy of a 1710 um, Fleischer harpsichord by Colin Booth and um, I've used it quite a lot for many Bach recordings and some of you may have seen it at SVF over the years. The piece you've just heard was a very fascinating piece that uh, was introduced to me by Peter Holman and um, it was described in one edition as being by Henry Purcell, in another by being by Johann Sebastian Bach and as Peter so wonderfully put it, it's been attributed to pretty much everybody in between. However, the more I got to know it and, and explore it, and with Peter's suggestion, the more I feel it might be by somebody like Dietrich Buxtehude. It feels very much under the fingers like Buxtehude's music. Anyway, it's a very fascinating composition full of quirks and really interesting things. The next piece is by Georg Böhm. This is an astonishing multi-section piece, as are, in fact, all the works in this programme. And it starts with this very repeated bass, this very ostinato bass pattern, that really sets the whole mood for this rather sort of almost inevitable tread of fate throughout the whole of the first um, movement, and finishes with a flourish, a peal of um, arpeggiated bells. It's, it's really rather a wonderful piece.
The next piece is by Johann Pachelbel. This is one of his varied arias. So we have a, a tune and then in this case six variations exploring all the different types of figuration available um, and really in lots of innovative ways. You get lots of innovative textures working um, their way through. It's immense fun to play because you, you get all these little quirks for your and uh, little workouts for your fingers. <laughs>
I'm going to finish this recital with one of Bach's seven toccatas. These are for manuals alone, so they're, I feel they're probably more harpsichord works than organ works, and particularly the textures that he builds up in the freer section feel like harpsichord textures, but on the other hand, they're equally playable on the organ, and very successfully. What's fascinating about these is that even though he's taking a form that is quite um, established by some of his older German contemporaries, the textures he creates and the virtuosity he asks of the player is quite outstanding. I hope you enjoy it and thank you for listening. Thank you.